Yes, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all participants joining us today. And a warm welcome to all of you for this fifth Tafisa Mission 2030 workshop as part of our workshop series. Today's workshop will focus on leveraging sport for all to tackle the climate crisis. And it is held in partnership with the think tank Sport and Citizenship. My name is Jean-Francois Laurent, Junior Director of Tafisa, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we go any further, I would like to give some uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, first of all, I uh, advise you that the workshop is recorded, so please turn off your cameras if you do not wish to appear on the screen. We have also muted all microphones by default, so to ensure a smooth running of the workshop. So we are kindly asking you not to unmute yourselves at any time in order not to disturb any of the speakers. If you wish to intervene, if you have a question, a comment, we invite you to write this question or this comment in the chat anytime during the session and the team behind the workshop will of course monitor those questions and we will ask them to the various speakers once the floor is open finally uh, and so that we can in the easiest way uh, share the questions with, with with the speakers we would like to ask all of you to rename yourself with your first name your last name but also the name of your organizations that we can refer to yourselves when uh, when voicing the question. Um, those would be for, for the few housekeeping rules. Uh, enough for me now, and I would like to, to officially kick off the workshop by giving the word to Tafisa Secretary General, Mr. Wolfgang Baumann, who will give first words of welcome. Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Jean-Francois, for these warm words of introduction. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or should I better say, dear colleagues and friends from all over the globe. I take it as a great privilege and pleasure to welcome all of you from wherever you are following today's workshop. I'm today calling in from a small town in the neighborhood of Frankfurt from my home office. We have surprising nine degrees plus, even though we should have snow at this time of the year. I'm proud to say that it is already the fifth event of the Tafisa Mission 2030 workshop series this year. What started in February this year from very humble beginnings has turned out over the recent months to become quite a success story. Today's version, we are co-hosting in partnership with the Sport and Citizenship Think Tank, represented today by its president, Laurent Thieu. Sport and Citizenship leads a powerful European network of experts, opinion makers, sports people, and politicians, and strives to promote sport serving society. It is a long time partner with whom we have co developed several projects over the years, leading us to this new type of collaboration with, for the first time, a joint online workshop. Please allow me to in particular express my gratitude to the German Olympic Sport Federation, the DOSB, that is not only joining forces with Tafisa for this workshop, with Bianca speaking, but supporting Tafisa in many ways all year long. Without DOSB, Tafisa would not stand where we stand today. As said before, today's workshop concludes the first year of the Tafisa Mission 2030 workshop series which has consisted in tackling and discussing the 12 themes of Tafisa Mission 2030 for a better world through Sport for All in a series of 12 workshops held this year and next year. I'm proud that our workshops have so far and including today gathered in total more than 1600 registered participants and more than 40 speakers from close to 100 countries worldwide, as well as various co-hosting partners, including Nike Incorporated, the Liverpool John Moores University, IAKS, which stands for the International Association for Sport and Leisure Facilities, Transparency International, ITTF, which is the International Table Tennis Foundation, and of course today, the Sport and Citizenship Think Tank. I'd already like to thank all of those who have joined us in 2020, 2021, encourage you to watch the replays of the past workshops on our YouTube channel if you have missed them, and tell you that we are already very excited for the year to come. 
The vivid debates that took place during the Tafisa Mission 2030 workshops will help us indeed to share good practices as well as review and sharpen our Mission 2030, which will update for our upcoming, which we will update for our upcoming Tafisa World Congress that is going to take place this June in beautiful Slovenia. What a better theme than the environment and more precisely leveraging sport for all to tackle the climate crisis to finish this year on a high note. This workshop has a very topical and time sensitive theme as it takes place a month after COP26 ended in Glasgow. This year's United Nations Climate Change Conference highlighted once again the urgency of the nations of the world to work together and tackle the climate crisis by enforcing the 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement and, among other indicators, to keep a global average temperature rise this century well below two cells, degrees Celsius and to drive efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The sport movement has a role to play and has been invited to act and reduce its carbon emissions to 50% before 2030 and to reach the objective of zero net emissions before 2040, according to the United Nations Sport for Climate Action Framework. We will hear more about this later, as we are happy to announce that we will have today a representative with us of United Nations Climate Change, who will intervene. What role can the Sport for All movement play and how it can contribute to leaving a positive environmental legacy to the future generations? This is what we will discuss today. To conclude, let me thank already now the team of Tafisa that has prepared with all of your support this edition. And my special thanks goes to Jean-Francois Gaetan Kerry and also Stacy, who is listening and following us from Seoul in Korea. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for those welcome words, Wolfgang. And it is now my pleasure to turn to Laurent Thiel, the president of Sport Citizenship. To give Hello, everybody. Uh, can you can you hear me? I presume, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm talking from uh, uh, Brussels capital of Europe. It's a pleasure for me and honor to be one of the speakers of this uh, workshop and in particular to uh, demonstrate uh, the high level of cooperation we strengthen with uh, uh, TAFISA organization. It's not the first uh, common event that we develop together, but today to co-organize in the frame of uh, TAFISA mission 2030 workshop series is really an honor for us and uh, I would like to thank all our colleagues from this organization, in particular Volgam and Jean-Francois. And uh, I'm happy to see that uh, we have organizations like uh, uh, UNFCCC with Lindita uh, and uh, the Larius uh, Foundation, uh, which are already committed uh, beside us in the reflection of the, of the team of, of today. Sport and citizenship uh, is, uh, as it was said by uh, Volgam, uh, an European think tank in the field of sport. Uh, I would precise an apolitical and independent platform for uh, new thinking on the role of uh, sport in our uh, society. Uh, the, 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 the team of today is crucial uh, for uh, all the sport uh, sector and uh, all its actors and uh, stakeholders need uh, to be involved in the question of uh, climate change. Uh, and to see uh, how can be the contribution of sports in the achievement of the EU Green, Lean, Green Deal uh, project, uh, uh, the carbon neutrality at the horizon of uh, 2050. That's a challenge and uh, we think that the contribution of sports and sports actor can be strong. Um, can I say that uh, uh, the European Council uh, in its resolution released on the 4th of uh, December 2020 regarding the European uh, Union work uh, plan for sport emphasized uh, on the development of uh, what we call green sports as a key uh, aspect for European 
but also national and uh, local policies for the uh, sports sectors. Uh, in this uh, resolution, uh, three key dimensions uh, uh, were mentioned. First, uh, education for, for sustainable sport. Second, environmentally friendly sport practice, facilities and uh, events. And third, evolution of sport and its practice in the light of uh, climate change. Um, let me conclude saying that uh, the importance of sports as a tool to share common value and education, the youth of uh, uh, environment issue. First, uh, can I say that sport can be a means of education for the youngest, but also contribute to solving societal problem alongside other actors. All forms of uh, environment engagement and greener and more active citizenship must be promoted for all. Second, uh, we think that sport can be used as an educational tool to promote specific environmental, environmental goals by combining learning and physical activity. Uh, as an example, sport could educate with uh, what I call an eco-responsible actions, teach uh, them about the immediate environment and outdoor activities and raise awareness pollution. And finally, in the long term, uh, sport can bring uh, out good practices, but also change behaviors towards the preservation, the protection and knowledge of the environment. It is necessary to build bridges uh, between actors who together can make a difference. I'm happy to conclude my, my, my introduction saying that uh, our colleague uh, Rodolphe Duarte will be uh, one of the moderators of this session. And once again, I'm so happy to share uh, this uh, new co-organization with our colleague and friend from Tafisa. Thank you and have a good conference. Thank you very much for those very warm words and welcome, Laurent. As you rightly said, uh, we have your colleague Rodolphe Duarte, who is head of EU Affairs at Sports Citizenship, who will be today co-moderating the workshop, uh, especially managing the interactive part of it. I think that you already have warm-up polls for us, Rodolphe. Exactly. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be there. Um, and yes, I will be co-moderating, but with a specific aspect, because we will have, uh, let's say, an interactive part of the workshop, which, is, which will be on the platform that is called Bcast. So I'm actually putting a link uh, right now in the chat. So you can basically just click on the link. There is no registration whatsoever. You just link on the link and you will arrive on the activities. I will, I will wait for you to, to join us on the activity and then we will start. Uh, so maybe to give you a bit more information about what we want to do, uh, we want to make sure that all of us, all the organizations that are present today, uh, either organizing, speaking, or just watching, uh, can realize that we all have a role to play when it comes to mitigating climate change and, uh, let's say, working on the climate issue. Those questions will be made to get your opinion on elements, but also uh, introduce our speakers with let's say, facts that we should all should know related to the sports and uh, the climate change. I'm still, I'm, I'm still waiting for, for, for some of you, and then we will, we will uh, slowly start the, um, the, the activities together. Uh, and what I will do, I will share my screen so you can see the situation and how you will arrive. That's right, yeah and share. And I think you can all see my screen now. Oh, so the first activity, uh, for those that are at reserve, I'm still, I'm still waiting a bit, uh, will be what we call the cloud world. Uh, the, the first question is actually really easy. For you and for your organization, for your ideas, what is the main priority when it comes to sport for all and climate change? So when I will start the activity, you will have to just Put forward some words, some ideas, and we will see with all the speakers and all the uh, the different persons that are present today, which words and which topics are the most important for the for the person attending the workshop. Uh, so I will start the activity in ten seconds. I, st I, I still see some people joining the with with the link, and you will have one minute to add some words. Uh, and there we go.
So it's really interesting to see all the different words and we see that at the moment, respect is still in front. And I actually like this word and I like the idea that is behind the question of respect. It's, let's say a bit more global and respecting the environment, respecting the organization, respecting the goals. And the activity is now down and you can see in front of you the different answers that were given. So of course the respect, but also education, inclusivity, cooperation, awareness, accountability are the, 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 the most interesting in my opinion. And I'm sure that all next speaker and all of the uh, next speakers will uh, talk uh, to us about those, those, those questions and those notions. So Jean-Francois, you have the floor and I'll see you back for the next question. Thanks a lot, Rodolphe, for introducing this interactive tool. And it's already very interesting to, to see those, those thoughts that you have all shared with us. I really look forward to, to the next four questions throughout the session. It's now time for us to, to turn to the first speaker, our keynote speaker of today. We, we are very honored to have Dr. Martin Schmidt with us. Martin is Director of Programs and Grants at the Laureus Sports for Good Foundation, and he's responsible for leading and overseeing the implementation of more than 250 programs in more than 40 countries across the globe. Morton holds a PhD in economics and business administration. He has more than 20 years experience in leading, developing, implementing, evaluating and researching development programs, humanitarian responses and global development strategies and policies across Latin America, Africa and Asia. He has worked with a number of the world's most respected humanitarian organizations and today Martin will introduce the session's theme, Leveraging Sport for All for Against Climate Change through the Sport for Good environmental approach. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francois. Stacy, will you throw up the first slide on the screen, please? Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thanks to Tafisa and to Sport and Citizenship for the invitation to share a few thoughts. And of course, thanks to all of you for patiently lending me your ears for a few minutes. As Jean-Francois said, I'm Morten Schmidt. I'm Global Director of Programs and Grants at Laureus. And for those of you who don't know what Laureus is, Stacey, please go to slide two and start the short video. <laughs> Has the power to change the world. Celebrating the greatest. And the Lawyers Academy have chosen you saying both. I want to say to the young kids growing up, just live your dream, keep on pushing, and it will come true. It has the power to inspire. Promoting equality. To any girl or boy, if you guys look different, or if you think you look different, never let society determine what they think is possible. It has the power to unite people in a way that little us does. We all have different challenges, but we came together because of the game that we love, which is rugby. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Recognizing the inspirational I want to acknowledge Laureus for all the incredible work you do around the world and for changing people's lives. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. This is Laureus. Over 20 years on, and Nelson Mandela's words continue to be at the heart of the Laureus movement. Sport for Good Foundation. You guys do amazing work. I definitely get inspired very much and motivated by what you do. It gave me an encouragement to proceed forward in my life, no matter what obstacle I face. Now in its third decade, Laureus Sport for Good has reached more than 6 million children and young people, giving them hope, support and life skills, aided by an inspirational network of over 300 athlete influencers. Laureus supports more than 250 sports-based programs in over 50 countries, changing the lives, opportunities, and perceptions of young people every day and all over the world. One sports field at a time, Laureus is using sport to ensure everyone wins. Sport has the power to change the world.
Thank you. Let's jump to slide three. According to the United Nations, climate change, as you will all know, is the defining issue of our time. And we are at a defining moment. The scientific community reached a near consensus on human-induced climate change in the early 2000s, and the consensus has grown ever since. Evidence of climate change is already apparent in the hotter global mean temperature, in rising sea level, warming oceans, which again make storm activities such as hurricanes and typhoons more frequent and severe. Changing rain patterns, extended droughts, increased wildfire activity, and so much more. In sport and sport for development has historically been, I'm afraid, and remains part of the problem, as we all probably also recognize by now. For instance, the booming golf courses throughout the world in the last part of the past century increased the use of pesticides and insecticides, contributed, contributing to the depletion of freshwater sources and introduced species aggressive to the surrounding environment. And everyone, please do forgive me. I myself, I am a guilty golfer. I have a really bad environmental conscience. But I would also add that managed well golf courses can contribute to increasing biodiversity and can perform a range of environmental services, including as carbon basins. But also large sports events ranging from football matches to the Olympic games generate waste and impact of unimaginable proportions and set enormous carbon footprints. Motorsports is burning fossil fuels as, as an integrated part of practicing the sport. And even small scale sport for development programs cannot go entirely free. The practice of using single use plastic bottles for water during sports events, for instance, or the fact that many organizations cannot seem to produce enough branded products are just a few examples of negative environmental impact. And I don't see that many sports or sport for development programs will go free. It is also worth noting that in sports, we are not only part of the problem, we also experience the impact of climate change, such as deteriorating playing surfaces at venues, damage to buildings and infrastructure due to storms and hurricanes, coastal erosion, warmer winters resulting in less snow, increased injuries to players due to heat exhaustion, etc. As much as being a contributor, we fall victim to climate change. Uh, next slide, number four, please. Back to Laureus. We consist of the World Sports Awards, the World Sports Academy, and the Sport for Good Foundation, all under the name of Laureus, and all three of which you just saw in action in the video. We were founded under the patronage of Nelson Mandela, President Nelson Mandela, at the inaugural World Sports Awards in 2000. And our vision is to use the power of sport to end violence, discrimination, and disadvantage for children and young people across the world. We work to contribute to seven of the sustainable development goals through programs, through knowledge, research, and convening, and through high level advocacy and influencing to increase the use of sport for social development. And at Laureus, we have an outreach well into the commercial parts of sports. We reach into elite sports in the Federation and we reach deep into the global sport for development movement. In 2021, as the video said, we are directly supporting more than 250 organizations uh, across well over 40 countries. And we reach even more stakeholders through training and other outreach activities. And being who we are and considering the role we play and can play in sport and sport for development. We feel that we have a particular responsibility to promote an agenda of environmental sustainability. Yes, in sport, we are part of the problem. Yes, in sports, we are victims of climate change. And yes, in sports, we must be part of the solution. Next slide, please. It was this recognition that in February 2020 drove us to become signatory to the UN Sport for Climate Action Framework, which I believe you will hear more about uh, from the next speaker, uh, from Lindita. If you're not already signatory to the framework, I will highly recommend you to consider it and to start following the same principles that we signed up to, which are to undertake systematic efforts to promote greater environmental responsibility. It's to reduce the overall climate impact, to educate for climate action. And I did take notice that education was one of the, the key issues mentioned in this uh, initial survey. 
It is also to promote sustainable and responsible consumption and to advocate for climate action through communication. And at Laureus, when deciding the, the lines of action to take in adherence of these principles, we started looking inwards at our own operations, aiming at reducing our overall climate impact from all the stuff we do. And the vehicle for change became new internal policies and procedures to promote greater environmental responsibility and reduce our overall carbon footprint. And it has resulted in some quite dramatic changes in the way that we're operating as an organization. We also started looking outwards towards the commercial brands in sport and sport for development, towards our peers in the sector and towards our program partners in sport for development that work with children and young people on the ground in the communities from Vanuatu and New Zealand in the east to Colombia, Mexico and California in the west. Uh, slide six, please. In relation to the brands, we recently launched the Sport for Good Index at COP26 in Glasgow. And for those of you who, who, don't, who don't know what it, what it is, uh, the Sport for Good Index is an annual in a list of brands that are leading the way in delivering positive social and or ecological impact through sports. The index celebrates those brands that through collaboration, innovation and creativity are making significant contributions across the 17 sustainable development goals as laid out by the United Nations. And determined by an independent judging panel of industry experts, the index is the product of a rigorous assessment of brand activities. And with a judging process independently educated by Ernst & Young, ensuring total transparency and due diligence into the selection, this best-in-class index recognizes brands, big and small, that we are putting all together, we are putting tangible action at the heart of the investment in sport. And if you wish to learn more about it, please do visit our website at laureus.com. Slide seven, please. Looking towards our peers and towards the small and large sport for development organizations that make up this, the sector, we wanted to develop a toolkit for climate action that any organization in our space could use to take local action. And we launched the Sport for Good Environmental Action Toolkit on Earth Day 2021. Becoming an environmentally sustainable organization, let alone sector, doesn't happen overnight, of course. It's a process. It begins with making a commitment to learn about how individual programs and organizations and activities and events can do no harm to the environment, uh, including reducing waste and, and pollution. The first step in becoming a more environmentally sustainable organization is to identify how the organization's actions and operations impact the natural environment and how to minimize that impact. Some of the questions we recommend our partners to ask themselves are, how much waste are we producing and can the waste be reduced, recycled or composted? Why do we produce so much waste? Could we cut down on how much we purchase or consume? What kind of packaging do our deliveries come in? Where do we get our energy? How much energy do we use? Are there ways to reduce our energy use? Or how much water do we use? Are there ways to reduce our water use? How do people get to our facility? Are there opportunities to leverage public transit options, for instance, providing it safe and available? What natural features exist on our site? Plant life, animals, rivers, or streams? What can we do to protect the nature that exists here? For instance, reducing or eliminating pesticide use, speaking of golf, uh, or by cleaning up riverbanks or by planting native flora. And this is only to get started. In the toolkit you, toolkit, you can find many more questions to ask in this initial effort to understand our impact. Next slide, please. The second step, let's be clear, action doesn't happen only by the CEO going off to write a policy or sign a global framework. It requires people, it requires participation, it requires wider internal mobilization to get the relevant stakeholders on board, to drive the development of policy and procedures, to generate ideas and opportunities for action and to anchor the commitment organization-wide. And there are many opportunities to promote sustainable practices. In promoting biodiversity, for instance, avoid building new sports facilities in places where there were previously green space. In sustainable waste management, why not reuse or upcycle equipment or furniture? or implement recycling and composting at the office. 
in sustainable communication, you could publicly announce your organization's commitment to environmental sustainability, and maybe even publish a list of the immediate actions being taken by your organization to advance the SDGs. And if you want to go even further, you could find ways for your community to hold you accountable on these commitments and actions. And let's go to the last slide. I promise you, I will come to an end now. Sport organizations and sport for development organizations represent an important community meeting place. Educating athletes, volunteers, staff, and fans on the opportunities to voice their concerns for the environment is an important step we can take to advance climate action. And nobody expects us to be climate change experts. So don't hesitate to engage with the partners who may know better how you can become environmentally more sustainable. We did. Seek ways to align with wider efforts in your community. Find inspiration in what others are doing. And feel free to use the Sport for Good Environmental Action Toolkit, which you can find by reaching out to me. Uh, and you can probably easiest find me on LinkedIn or by navigating through our website, glorious.com. As a sector, there are ways we can all become part of the solution. And it all starts with a commitment. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tafisa. And uh, thank you very much also to Sport and Citizenship for your invitation. And to everyone, enjoy the conversations today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for, for our most inspiring uh, first presentation today. Um, I would like to invite everybody, uh, if you have any questions, please write them on the chat and we will uh, come to these questions in a second. Um, maybe while we are waiting for a few questions to, to pop up, I really like to highlight three learnings I have from this. That sport is part of the climate crisis problem, but sport is also part of the solution and everybody can be part of the solution by taking actions which, which can be easily uh, done for by everyone or every organization. Maybe a first question uh, for, for you, Martin, while we are waiting uh, for more. I mean, you, we, you are funding and you are also uh, supporting a number of projects across the globe in, in, in this field of sport for development, but also climate action is part of it. Do you have success stories already to share? Uh, do you have examples of, of what grassroots organizations are doing on the field indeed to, to, to fight against the climate crisis? It is beginning to move. It's, it's moving slowly, um, but it is beginning to move. I think one of the exciting examples that we see is a, a partner that we are supporting in Lesotho, in Africa, in Southern Africa, uh, Kick for Life, who is changing the way they are providing facilities from moving from old fashioned, quite resource heavy facilities lots of conventional construction work taking place, moving towards a more environmental sustainable way of delivering uh, football facilities for the programs that they're delivering. They work in, in sexual and reproductive health and rights. They're not an environmental organization, but they did ask themselves how the management of their facilities could become more sustainable. And that, in, that in, involves developing an entirely new way of thinking football stadium, football facilities, uh, involving a whole range of different climate related actions. So that's, that's a very good, good example of someone taking quite comprehensive action within the organization. But you can even see towards Loris ourselves, one of the things we have done, since you did mention our grant making across the world, in the past, we had individual grant managers sitting with portfolios that could potentially stretch across three continents. We are now changing it. So when they do travel out to visit programs, they all travel to one, one set geographic area, one concentrated geographic areas. So they don't need to fly to Latin America, to Southern Africa, to East Asia. They can just fly one place and see all their partners. And then we have another grant manager sitting in one of the other regions. So that's one of the ways that we as, as, as an organization have taken initiative. Uh, but it is happening little by little, changing the use of plastic bottles, for instance, uh, integrating recycling in, in, in the way that, that waste is, is managed within the organizations. This also to a great extent depend on external services, of course, but to the extent that you 
you can uh, effectively and reasonably manage recycling, for instance, then that would be one of the ways forward as well. Thanks for that, Morten. I see in the chat that there is one more question uh, for you from Leonardo Calix, as I think from Sesqui Sao Paulo in Brazil. Morten, would you bring to us any sustainable good practices in sports events? I think the best I can do is to refer you, <laughs> maybe not so much to our external tool toolkit, but to our internal toolkit, where we have a whole set of guidelines on how we can make our, our events more sustainable. Uh, there are a bit of recommendations going into the, uh, the, um, the external toolkit, the ones that I, was, that I was talking about. But Laurier's being an event organizer as well. We do golf tournaments. Yeah, here we go again with the golf. Uh, we do cricket tournaments. We do bicycle races. We do a whole range of different things uh, to promote the sport for development agenda. And all of these events are now being informed by our internal uh, sustainability policies and procedures, forcing us to take more sustainability uh, actions when we do host these kinds of events. Thanks a lot, Martin, for, for sharing this. And, and for those of you who have interest, especially in sustainable sport events, especially, I can encourage you to look on the TAFISA website. We have a sport for all in the environment toolkit as well. So just focusing on events, so much less broad than what you did for, for, for the sport for, sport for good environmental toolkit, but this could be also useful. Thanks a lot, Martin, for, for your intervention and for kicking this workshop so, so well today. And um, before we move to our next speaker, Rodolphe, I believe we have another question. Yes, indeed. So coming back to me for the for the bit of fun. Uh, so now uh, it will be only one question. Up, and I think if you are, you can see the question now. Uh, so this question actually refers to a report that was made by WWF France in collaboration with the French Ministry of Sports. A really interesting report uh, that is talking about uh, the impact of climate change on actually the activity of sports. So of course, how many months of physical activity could be lost per year in a plus four degrees world? So I'm starting the activity. You will see more than one answer. And in your opinion, how many months will be used in a plus four degrees world? You have 30 seconds to answer. It's a, it's a bit short, but uh, there is only one choice to have. Hey, it was two months, uh, so four months. Uh, I see that a lot of people consider that four months. We all agree that there are a lot of consequences, not that much, but it's, it's, I think it's going to come to that if we don't change our, our, our way of doing things. Uh, but it, it also relates to the fact that it was just said that we are also, at a sports sector, victim of the climate change. And that's exactly why we, we, we decided to, to, to do these questions. Uh, because all the sports stakeholders have a role to play uh, in mitigating climate change and its impact. And in this spirit, of course, our next speaker, representing Sport for Climate Action of the, UB, uh, of the United Nations, will be a more than important actor to gather expertise and gather organization on this topic. So Jean-Francois, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Rodolphe, and we will indeed be moving now to, to our next speaker. We are very lucky to have with us today Mrs. Lindita Zaferi Salihu. Uh, Lindita Le leads works on sectors engagement in climate action as part of UN climate change wider global climate action work. She leads development of both sports for climate action and fashion industry charter for climate action, and she also works closely with a variety of stakeholders to mobilize key actors and catalyze ambitious action towards decarbonization. Before joining UN Climate Change, Lindita worked in public relations and coordinating projects promoting multi-stakeholder engagement in policy and sustainability. Lindita will introduce today in her address the Sport uh, for Climate Action Framework and also the new Net Zero Strategy. Lindita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jean-Francois, and uh, thanks very much to Tafisa and also Sports 
and citizenship for this uh, great event. Um, I've been enjoying uh, the previous speakers very much, and I think we're all very much aligned in what we're trying to do um, here, um, getting everyone, including ourselves, to be part of the, of the solution on climate. I think our, our previous speakers um, already mentioned, but um, you probably all know that COP26 in Glasgow took place um, over the two weeks, uh, starting from 31st of October to um, 13th of November. Um, and it saw the registration of more than 50,000 people, both uh, in person and virtual. Um, so, you know, there's there's huge interest and huge momentum, of course, um, to, to, to be there and, and be part of these discussions and push for more action. And besides uh, negotiations, uh, which usually happen um, at these events, um, hundreds of climate action events took place in the auspices or the sidelines of COP as well. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, main objectives of COP26 were really to get um, commitments from countries to um, cut emissions to keep within uh, reach the global warming limit of 1.5 degrees, um, but at the same time to reach the target of $100 billion per year of climate finance to developing countries and vulnerable countries. Um, as we all know, climate change is no longer a faraway concern. It is here and it is happening. Um, and third as well is to, to, to get agreement on, on the Paris rule book and ways uh, to account and be transparent about climate actions. And of course, it was an important uh, moment to reestablish trust in multilateralism, um, to move um, action agenda closer to the center and, and uh, many other things. Um, you've probably read about the outcomes and whilst of course we know that we're still faced with, with a gap that needs to be uh, urgently addressed, we have at the same time seen some signs of progress from leading countries and from non-state actors um, in the space. And of course, if these commitments that we're seeing are implemented faithfully, um, these actions will deliver progress in meaningful ways across the three pillars of, of uh, Paris Agreement, which are mitigation, adaptation and finance. And certainly, um, as you all know, and uh, something that is, of course, um, important for sports as well, uh, is to say that science, nature and urgency are put front and center um, at the Glasgow Climate uh, Agreement. Um, and hopefully they, they will be used to further galvanize global efforts behind 1.5 degrees with a focus to cut um, emissions uh, that we need to cut uh, in this decade. Um, this is a time really marked by uncertainty, uh, mistrust, and, uh, and certainly escalating uh, climate impacts. So COP26 has affirmed just how essential it is that we all work together to address uh, the climate crisis. And while we're not yet on track, um, the progress that's been made over the last years and at the climate summit did offer some bright spots um, and, and a foundation to, to continue to build upon. Um, so enough about COP, although there's lots to say there. Um, I think for this particular audience, we're here to talk about sports for climate action. I think um, it was mentioned before by previous speakers. Thank you very much for that. Um, what we um, know is that the world faces a climate emergency. And as we heard before, sports can very well be part of the solution. Uh, we of course need everyone, regardless of their size, to play their part. And that means working together to enable um, uh, industries like sports that are very much out there and very close to communities around the world to create that change. Um, it means also to try and see how we can align on the goals and the targets uh, across the world of sports. Um, how can we involve athletes, fans and communities in this journey? We believe that UNFCCC Sports for Climate Action has elevated a little bit the, the topic of climate. And of course, there's been a lot of uh, considerations and conversations before the framework was there on sports and sustainability. But I think we have managed to sort of bring the right people to the table at the right time um, to, to see how can we uh, push uh, the entire industry uh, ambition at speed and at scale. Um, so we worked together with uh, also a lot of you here in the call, I see many friends of the framework uh, in this call, um, to, to build a concrete and ambitious plan of action. Um, but we know that we need a collective spirit to achieve it. Um, and of course, we need a movement that reflects that wonderful diversity of sports and, and the world in which it operates. 
So the framework, uh, Sports for Climate Action um, as a framework was built in uh, 2018. Um, we have brought together sports organizations to talk about what could be some of the opportunities for sports to use our microphones to mobilize global society to take action on climate. And back then what we had heard was that sports really wanted to uh, do the job at home before they can actually go out and speak about it. So they wanted to uh, mobilize internally to see what can be done uh, on behalf of their organizations and at the same time also communicating about it, which is why we have two framework objectives. One, which is really to set sports uh, and align it with the goals of the Paris Agreement, um, and at the same time, uh, using it as a unifying tool to mobilize uh, stakeholders across the world. And from that, then we go to five principles, which I think Morton uh, just went through and, and, and uh, basically uh, saying that if you're committed to the framework, you are going to review your policies and your internal um, uh, procedures to embed environmental considerations in business as usual. Um, the, the point here is that we are looking at transitioning the way we operate, the way we live, the way we consume today. Um, so that train has left the station, uh, as we have heard many times. So I think it's now we're kind of grappling with, OK, what, what needs to happen and how do we do it? And it seems too difficult. And, you know, um, there's nothing we can do. We're too small. But I think we cannot underestimate the power, especially of sports, to, to, to um, inspire uh, change by walking the talk. And, and certainly by embedding those environmental considerations, what we mean to say is sports should not just take climate action for the sake of it but they need to really do it in the context of sustainable development goals by looking at those aspects that the group here has seen as relevant, like respect and education and awareness and inclusivity, accountability. So all these things need to be really included in there. One thing that sometimes kind of looks to really um, complicate, um, excuse me, uh, to complicate um, the whole kind of climate action is this sense that it, it is too complicated, it is too difficult. And of course, the difficulty there is that for any credible climate action, you need science behind it, right? As, as boring as it may sign, sound, we need numbers behind it. We need to be able to measure our progress. And we need to be able to be really articulate and open about the challenges that we see, right? Because this is not something that we can solve on our own. But if we don't know the challenges and if we always hear how great everybody's doing, we're never going to get to the gist of it. To really try and see and, and talk to other sectors as well and say, here's where we have our problems and let's try and solve these together. Um, at the same time, of course, the other principles are looking at reducing overall climate impact. Now, we know that some organizations will have a much bigger impact and others uh, a much smaller impact, but there is a climate impact and there's always things that organizations can do. So here, the idea was for organizations to create that climate neutrality plan to measure their emissions and have a sense of where, where these emissions are, are created. Um, so basically, you know, as we all know, what you don't measure, you can't really uh, reduce and you can't really address. So it's having that understanding of what is it, where is our largest impact? What are some of the quick wins that we can actually uh, you know, employ right now? Uh, what can be done? And where do we need the help of the others to help us really move forward? And also, what are some of the opportunities to uh, influence our supply chain, uh, right? Supply chain of sports organizations, companies that they deal with, sponsorships. So there's a lot of kind of influence that sports can use um, to, to, to start uh, uh, really uh, propelling that change that we all need. Um, then certainly educate for climate action is there, not just to educate fans and community, but also to educate peers and other sports in terms of lessons that have been learned. I think we're too late now, as you uh, all know and will appreciate in terms of taking action. And of course, we're all learning lessons. And I think it will be very important that we have those lessons out there, um, that we tell people what worked and what didn't and why it didn't work. Um, so that uh, a lot of the organizations can then really leapfrog and move on, move on to, to, to next things. And to promote sustainable uh, and responsible consumption is there just to say that, you know, as we all know, the current patterns of producing and consuming today are not sustainable. We need five more planets or more than that um, to, to continue to do what we did. So I think here sports have multiple roles as well and opportunities to look at, you know, can they really create uh, those types of 
policies internally to 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 you know procure more sustainable products look at circularity look at all these different things that not just generate emission reductions but also go beyond that and provide um, sustainable benefits to the planet but at the same time there's also a lot of um, potential here for sports to for example promote low carbon transportation or um, uh, you know try and reduce that in in different ways um, promote more of the local uh, consumption uh, local production uh, and so on um, and then finally, advocate for climate action. In the framework, besides sports organizations, we also have um, sports media involved who are increasingly reporting on what sports should do and can do and are doing about climate action. Uh, but at the same time, of course, uh, the microphones, as I mentioned at the beginning of sports organizations is huge. And I think it's being increasingly uh, used um, to uh, promote uh, uh, climate action uh, as well. So at COP, what we've done uh, really, um, we had a high level event uh, in, the, in the global climate action arena, which was hosted by um, UNFCCC. And there we had a number of um, organizations uh, that are part of the framework, as well as our executive secretary, Prince Albert of Monaco. And um, there were a few um, other speakers. Now I don't wanna go through all the names, but some really great speakers. And we've launched an ambitious uh, plan of action for sports. So for those organizations that are really willing to go beyond and be at, uh, on the leadership space, we have outlined a plan of reducing uh, halving emissions by, 20, uh, by 2030 uh, and then um, uh, achieving net zero by uh, 2040. And at the same time, uh, looking at you know, what areas they need to look at, uh, how they should be uh, accountable for their actions um, at the same time, which I'll talk to in my next slide. But just to say that the event was really viewed more than 10,000 times. So I think uh, it just goes to show how important this subject is because it speaks to people and, and sports and climate kind of makes uh, the, the, the topic, which in, in some ways sounds very technical and very far away, brings it very close to people uh, who are following uh, sports. Um, so just to say then, this ambition, uh, ambitious plan of action, it requires signatories to measure their emissions within six months of signing, um, and then set that 50% reduction goal across uh, all scopes. So it's really looking at own operations, but also the supply, ch supply chain, which I mentioned before. Um, the, the commitment also asks to start with actions immediately. Now, of course, we've said, and we heard it from previous speakers, you know, if you just sign a piece of paper and do not much about it, it's not going to be enough. So I think it's more to really um, start acting as quickly as possible um, to achieve those, uh, those targets and, and, and create a plan in terms of where are you going to be looking at and how is this going to be possible for you? And if it's not going to be possible, then let's talk about where these challenges are and, and you know, is there a way for us, for us, to, for us to help as, as a community of sports organizations? At the same time, in terms of accountability, we're asking organizations to report on an annual basis, um, not to say, okay, this is not enough, or you need to do more, but it's more really to understand exactly where these problems are, but at the same time, looking at where these organizations are doing great and, and showcase that and, and tell everyone that action is possible. It is actually being taken and here are the benefits. Um, and certainly we convened uh, in the last couple of um, years, uh, a few working groups, and we're going to look at going forward to see how can we uh, make them a little bit more uh, tailored or fit for purpose to, to respond to these uh, new, uh, new commitments. So I will stop here and of course happy to, to answer any questions, but just to say that generally, um, you know, we are very thrilled to have about 300 uh, uh, organizations on board, sign, signed on to the principles at the same time, about 50 organizations have signed on to these ambitious targets and became members of, of Race to Zero, which is this global campaign. Um, managed by um, COP champions. And um, I think um, that there's a lot of potential. Um, and uh, of course, we need uh, the help of everyone um, to be really vocal about solutions that exist so that we can pass them on and we can uh, empower all sports organizations to actually uh, be part of the solution. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Lindita, for this very interesting presentation presenting the Sport for Climate Action framework. So I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that anybody is welcome to join as long as they, they, they are complying with the various requirements and they are welcome to, to write to you through the email which you have put 
on your slide and maybe we can put it in the chat uh, to, to learn more and also to uh, to see whether they can join. So th thanks a lot for that. I see one question in the chat that might be interesting. Um, somebody is, uh, so it is Marisa Schlenker who is asking whether there are any systems out there, any support available somewhere to, to help organizations uh, measure and gather environmental data and local sustainability metrics. So we, so we, for Sports for Climate Action signatories, just to say, of course, it's open to any kind of sports organization, uh, provided that they have, you know, they can actually implement the principles of the framework, implement the targets and reporting and so on. Um, it is not um, currently open for, um, you know, NGOs or charity um, organizations, just because uh, we, we have no potential, no, no uh, resources to kind of um, serve all, all those huge uh, number of organizations out there uh, that are active in the space. But I think in terms of standards, what we've done through these working groups, we've tried to get all signatories to upload <clears throat> a lot of the links to the tools that they are using already, right? But if you're a small organization, of course, we can provide you with some um, kind of um, basic calculators and so on and, and give you some guidance in terms of where you need to look at and there's a guidance also for for these 50% uh, uh, reduction as well but I think um, I think if you're a larger organization uh, this needs to 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 take another approach right because we're talking about transitioning uh, business and at the end of the day sports organizations are businesses right so it's really looking at getting a third party um, organization to help support put the right management a system in place uh, and of course for many other things and webinars and so on we are happy to, to support. Thanks a lot uh, Lindita. I see that that now the, the time of our session is, is running so I, I will uh, initiate the, the second part of this workshop after those first two keynote speakers so Martin, Lindita once again thank you. Uh, I think what, what, we, what we heard and this is something very important is that every organization no matter how small can have a role to play. And it is really TAFISAs and sport and citizenships will and, and main objective always to, to connect the policy, what we have heard from you, Lindita, also to connect the strategy, what we have heard from you, Morton, into practice. And one might say that sport for all, we are not as big as elite sport, as professional sports, and maybe we are not the ones to, to, to be able to make a change. But from our point of view, this is not true. And this is again what we have heard from the two of you. And, and that's why in the second part of the session now, we have a panel. We have a round table where we have gathered representatives of various organizations, which are very much coming from the grassroots and will showcase good practices, will showcase approaches that they have taken at the, at the local level or sometimes at the international level within the sport for all movement to fight against climate change. So I'm very happy today that we have four speakers in this round table. We have Mrs. Antidia Sitores, who is lobbying manager at the Surfrider Foundation. We have Mrs. Beth Sylvester, campaign director of the Catmosphere Foundation. We have our third panelist, Mrs. Alexandra Williams, program development consultant at Durban Grid Corridors in South Africa. And we finally have with us Mrs. Bianca Cardocus, who is Officer for Sport Facilities, Environment and Sustainability at the German Olympic Sports Confederation. So each of those uh, speakers and panelists will, will intervene and share the, their good practices. Before that, I'd like to pass the word once again to, to Rodolf for, for another question for us today. And I'm showing my screen again. And for this, it's actually a question I hold really dear. Uh, and a topic uh, that is a really uh, of strong interest for me. And I actually saw that two speakers actually added surf pictures in the presentation in Nazare and another one. So that's even, that's even better. Um, so I'm starting the activity. I'm just reading the questions. So for several years, uh, global warming has an accelerating effect on how much the sea level rises. In 50 years, the amount of land surface lost corresponds to up and you will see the different answers and see which one is the which one is the is the is the good answer still 30 seconds to answer Up. 
Apple is done. And ah, actually, most of people got it. Ah, no, not the most. Most of people got it right, but a lot of people got it right. Yeah, and it's four thousand two hundred football fields that were lost due to uh, sea rise level. Uh, and the thing is, we are not all equal in the terms of uh, of those problematic. I think some some countries that are represented here uh, have a really really stronger uh, emphasis on these questions and uh, have stronger consequences. And to actually talk about the question of climate change uh, and ocean protection, could we really find uh, a better organization than Sofrida uh, to discuss uh, this topic? And I will give back the floor to Jean-François and to our next speaker, which I really, really, really want to hear. Uh, so back, go back to you, uh, Jean-François. Thanks a lot, Rodolphe. I think indeed that this question, I didn't know 4,200 football pitches, but it really uh, trans transitions very well to our next speaker, Antidia C. Torres, who is a lobbying manager at the Surfrider Foundation. And Antidia will talk about protecting the world's oceans, waves and beaches, as well as the European Green Sports Hub. Antidia, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot and thanks for this invitation from Tafisa and Sport and Citizenship. Um, we have been created by citizens. So Freda Foundation Europe is uh, an NGO dedicated to the protection of the ocean and users. And we have been created by users, surfers, especially in the United States, in California at the beginning. And then we came to Europe uh, 30 years ago um, to manage some environmental problem that we have some news from whistleblowers and the whistleblowers were surfers. Nowadays, we have three main topics, three main issues that we want to tackle at environmental aspects. So the first one is water quality and health. And when we talk about water quality and health, we talk also about sports. Uh, so the second one is marine litter. Um, marine litter could be like not link with sports except with sports impact but uh, may i just remind that some of the brazil competitions on sailing have just been cancelled due to the amount of marine litter on the zones of competitions so we are part of the solution we are part of the victims too and the third point and i and i want to go to deeper in this is the climate change aspect so um, due to stormy aspects, sometimes we host surfers are part of the winners of the climate change in a very little aspect because uh, uh, Laurie's uh, PowerPoint shows a Nazare wave because we have biggest wave, we have stormy waves. So, but this is just half part or a very little part of the, the income uh, of this stormy aspect. The other part is uh, more than frightening about when we talk about sea level rise, but also the degradation of the ocean and the degradation of also some health aspect uh, of the ocean. So this is just to, to uh, give a little background of who we are. So we are like 2,000 uh, people uh, involved uh, in the in the community at the European level and broader uh, at international level with Senegal, Morocco, Australia, Japan, uh, Argentina, Brazil. So we are everywhere, uh, every in each continent uh, present to deliver this kind of message, and of course to find solution to reduce uh, the impact on the several topics I just mentioned. On water quality and health, we have uh, many uh, wonders about the fact that we could have a degradation of uh, the waters. The first one is bacteriological aspect. The second one is chemicals that are more and more present uh, in the areas. We have the areas, areas in where we swim, we surf, we do kayak, uh, and we share with other users. And the third one that is less known is uh, algae. We have more and more algae that are present due to uh, the climate change, due to global warming. So they're just developed and sometimes we have disease due to, due to those algae 
and they are closed. Uh, the zones of uh, bathing water, of swimming, and of course for the tourists too. So it's just about sports, but it's about users for competition, but also by tourism. So this is part of the first prism. Uh, on marine litter, of course, uh, we have this challenge just to reduce single-use plastic. We have it everywhere. We have it on sponsors, goodies. We have it uh, on competitions like marathons. We have it uh, in several uh, sports that use a lot of single use, but also other activities. So this is also part of the gamble of Surfrata to start this dialogue with some brands to reduce at source as a retails, the distribution, and of course the transport of that kind of uh, goodies or that kind of products that could be uh, less single use and more reusable. And last part is the climate change. Of course, we have to adapt. There is no issue now. There is no more time. We need to adapt because we part of fail uh, to this uh, UNFCCC objective of the 1.5 degrees. We know that they we have still to uh, mitigate, but if we don't adapt, we will we lose this uh, part of the gamble. So on the adaptation, we know that sports and outdoor sports uh, more powerfully, I think, than the other one have to adapt their practices. Uh, I just thinking about a sister uh, association that is called Protect of Winter. And maybe in a few years, some areas in the mountains won't be, eh, won't be just accessible uh, to the sports uh, in the winter. So um, this is also a danger for the practices. And we will have this danger also for surf, for kayaking due to dry due to the fact that we have less and less zones uh, with uh, uh, the waters that are available uh, to do it and uh, the seasons that are just changing uh, without uh, advertising, without telling uh, that could be um, some changes in the, in the meteo that are really, really quick and, and we have to adapt our practices to, to those uh, constraints. Um, that's why we try to launch uh, a common sink and do tank that is the Green Spot Hub Europe. This sink and uh, do tank uh, has a, a global objective to share good practices and to find a way at the European level, because there is the same sink and do tank uh, at, uh, in the United States that it's uh, Green Sports Alliance, uh, just to share information, do self-assessment of all the federation, sport federation impacts and facilitated good practices to reduce the impact, measure, reduce and facilitate uh, and sharing knowledge about how to do it. So this is uh, the, the main objective of this uh, Green Hub Sport. Um, and it, it includes outdoor and indoor sports. This is also part of the um, specificity of this work. And it includes NGOs, NGO from the environment, NGO from local authorities. So one of the steering group member is the ACR plus. So we mean local authorities, municipalities, because they are also involved in the decision. When we build a new stadium, we do it with them. When we choose a new places uh, to, to swim, we do it with local authorities. So this is part of the approach uh, we want also to, to put on the table in the fact that we have to, to involve every stakeholder that is concerned about sport uh, and not just to be in l'entre-soi uh, of sports uh, and, and facilitate the inclusion of other competitors, but also other actors. Um, other member of sports federation like CV for the volleyball, athletics, cycling. So we have many disciplines, rugby too. Uh, and we aim on four uh, areas to have this improvement when we talk about environment. 
one and they are also linked uh, with ADs, SDGs. I, I don't precise it, but I think it's obvious. Uh, the first one is governance, because when we need to act, we need also to have a responsible governance uh, with an inclusion, with a strategy, an action plan that is willing and aiming uh, to have impact. The second one is organization, is how, how we do it, how we facilitate this impact and how we include it. And the last point is the what, and on what we have two priorities in the next three years, there is, there is sport events and sport goods. Events, because uh, there is many ways to do an event. It could be an international competition, it could be Olympic games, or it could be just a little competition at local. Uh, with children. So we have several targets, several ways to work, several ways to organize it, several culture in Europe to organize a, a meeting and several providers for each event. So this is also another part of the gamble to facilitate good practices, having in mind that there is many contexts and many different contexts to, to facilitate that. And about goods, this is uh, the other uh, aspect is what do we use when we do a sport competition? Do we need all the stuff we use it? Could we re could we reuse it from uh, um, a local competition to another local competition? And maybe a last but not least that is also involved between events and goods. It's traveling. When we mean that we and and I saw it in the first game you launched it, Rodolphe. Uh, that was sports local opportunities. And I think that this is part also of our responsibility to find the places nearest to us to facilitate a responsible sport. And, and I talk about surf, so I know about uh, the difficulty and, and the, the leverage sometimes of difficulty to make it. But this is part of the reflection we need to have and the gamble we have to do if we want to achieve some environmental objective and to tell that we are not more responsible than victims. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Antidia, for underlining all the activities that the Surf Rider Foundation, also especially in Europe, is, uh, is, is, is implementing. I think uh, it was a very important theme. I mean, our area of, of climate uh, protection or environmental protection and uh, that, that you have highlighted. And this is what we have really tried to do as part of this roundtable, that we have good practice from different areas. So we heard from the, from more the, the water side of things. We'll hear soon more about that biodiversity, about wilderness parks. We'll also hear ab about more policies and strategy at national level from Olympic committees. We can, we are all part of a solution in one way or the other. So thanks a lot, Antidia. For all of those who have questions for you, Please write them in the chat and we will come back to those questions at the end of the round table. So I already see a question for you now. We will open the floor at the end. You can already read it and we will go through it. Rodolphe, before we move to the next speaker, we have another question on Bcast. You are muted. Rodolphe, you are muted. As usual, it happens all the time. Uh, even after two, two years of using Zoom, I think we all have this issue at some point. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to the next question and it will be also an introduction to our next speaker. So the next question will be related to uh, biodiversity. Uh, so in the last 50 years, human activities have been responsible for the dissipation of, that's for you to say, percent of vertebrate population in average. I'm starting the activity now, and you can answer straight away. I'm not participating because I know the answer.
And yes, ah, it's actually close, but yeah, you had the right answer, 68%. And just think about this number. In the last 50 years, we've been responsible for the dispersion of 68% of vertebrate population, 68%. We can like wrap our head over this number again and again and again. And I think it's really hard to realize the, the, the impact and the, and, the, and the hardship of the situation uh, and the hardship of the situation. So that's why we wanted actually to, to talk about it, uh, because the fine, well, actually the, 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 the finding and the, those numbers are coming from uh, another WWF report uh, called Living Planets in, 20, in, in 2020. And the findings of the Living Planet reports are shocking and the lack, the lack of action to reverse uh, this decline uh, is unacceptable. We'll, we will be the victim as humans we will be the victim of natural decline, especially the most vulnerable populations. Uh, but this is not a fatality because we are also actors of change. And of course, especially our next speaker uh, with the organization Catmosse Foundation, from which we will hear right now. And I will let Jean-Francois introduce uh, our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks a, lot, for the yeah, thanks a lot, Rodolphe. 68% is a big number and uh, there are countless other species which are in danger of extinction. One, some species are big cats and we will hear uh, now from Beth Sylvester, who is campaign director at the Catmosphere Foundation, explaining how they are bridging biodiversity measures with uh, support for all physical activity. Beth, the floor is yours. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, can everybody see that? Great. Uh, well, thank you so much both to Tafisa and uh, Sport and Citizenship for having me and Catmosphere today. here today. Uh, what I wanted to do was really quickly walk you through Catmosphere and really speak to our first campaign that we've just had in November that really addressed the link between big cat conservation, humans and uh, climate change. So first off, just really answering the question, what is Catmosphere? Uh, Catmosphere is a foundation that was founded earlier this year that really has two purposes. We, uh, we raise awareness for big cat conservation and all the issues that entails. And then we also serve to amplify the work of Panthera. Uh, Panthera is actually the largest uh, big cat organization in the world. Uh, they work with a number of uh, smaller grantees, really on all cats, big cats and small cats uh, in the wild. And uh, we really focus a catmosphere on the seven big cats uh, versus all of those cats. So uh, just a little bit more about Panthera, as you can see here, these are the seven big cats and they really are the only organization in the world that is exclusively devoted to this conservation. Uh, one of the pieces that we really love about Panthera as, as an organization is that they're very grassroots, a very small percentage of their bunch, budget goes to overhead. Uh, the bulk of their funds are spent in the field either work that they do directly or that they do through their various partners on the ground. So if, you, if you're not familiar with them, I, I suggest taking a look. They are really an incredible organization. Um, so that leads me to Catwalk, which was our inaugural event, which we held in November. Uh, Tafisa was actually one of our strategic partners, which I will cover. Uh, so the first, you know, when we were looking at events, uh, we really, it was an interesting time. I think when we first set up Catmosphere, we were thinking of in-person events. Obviously, uh, COVID constrained that considerably. So we really looked at how do we do this in a way that we can get people outdoors, we can get people active, um, and in a way that is COVID-friendly. And so that's how we came up with Catwalk. The idea was to ignite physical movement locally while tr triggering the big cat conservation movement globally. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, first catwalk, which is hopefully the first of many, took place on the 6th of November. And what this was, was a mass participation seven kilometer walk, which was designed to raise awareness around big cat conservation. It was very flexible, it was very inclusive, it was designed to work for people of all physical um, capabilities and all ages, and really to have fun and create a community while at the same time learning more about big cats and how that plays into humans and the environment. So, you know, I've already covered what Catmosphere is as well as Panthera, but, you know, there's, you think of big cats and you think of sport, uh, you know, what is the link there? Uh, you know, big cats very much need physical activity as to humans. There's a very logical link there. Uh, one of the things that we have found is that often humans, unfortunately, tend to be selfish and really only interested in things that impact them. So we wanted to make it very clear that there is a clear 
impact uh, between the two. And that, you know, the idea of a healthy human is, is very similar to the idea of a healthy cat. Uh, you know, obviously going through COVID, we've seen a major uptick in mental health issues around the world. Uh, that was something we were trying to address. Big cats have a similar challenge um, as their natural habitats are broken up. There's a lot of alienation. They're, you know, they're, um, they don't have access to as many other cats as they might have done historically. Uh, so that was also very important. And one of the pieces that we incorporated into our education was really the, the importance of their habitat. Uh, that's important for them, but it's also important for us. Uh, you know, the big cats are an apex predator. When they go away, that has impact on the rest of the food chain, which obviously uh, has very obvious impacts for humans. So how did cat with catwalk actually work? Uh, the way we structured this, as I said, was intended to be as inclusive and flexible as possible. So they were, everything was done through our website, uh, which is you know, catmosphere.org. It's still up, uh, but obviously registration, which is, is currently closed. Uh, there were two ways to participate. One was to, to sign up for the catwalk, which allowed you the option to walk up to seven kilometers, although you could certainly walk, walk less if you so desired. And then we had catwalk cubs, which was only 700 meters, but was designed for kids. And the intention was kids would do that and then pick another activity. Um, all participants actually were, in part, were asked as, at registration to select which cat they were actually going to walk for. So you had choices of the seven, you could be team lion, you could be team tiger. Uh, and then we really tallied, uh, we wanted to add an element of gamification to this. So we were able to tally how many people were walking for each cat. Uh, you know, unlike a lot of um, walks and runs, there was not a fundraising component to this. We wanted to make sure that it was as accessible to as many people as possible. So we did not have uh, that requirement. And then after the event, we were able to go back and see which cat crew uh, walked walk the furthest and we were able to crown a winner, which in this, in the, this year was the leopard. Um, just going to take you through some of our stats to give you a sense of this was very grassroots, uh, got grassroots, we were running on a very small budget, and a lot of our success was really due to our strategic partners, uh, which were primarily in the world of sports, uh, we did partner with Google, uh, but in the world of sports, we did, as I mentioned, we partnered with uh, Tafisa, we partnered with Peace and Sport, the IOC, as well as the Special Olympics. So. Uh, overall, we had over 27,000 people participate, and they came from 102 countries and in total walked over 150,000 um, kilometers. And then again, for us, it's really you know, important, somebody mentioned earlier, of measuring things. For us, it's very important to measure and really understand who participated. Uh, you can see here the breakdown by cat. Obviously, the leopard was the winner. Uh, we looked at age, we looked at adults versus kids, obviously we looked at different parts of the world, and we looked at gender, uh, all of those just really are helping to inform our thinking going forward. And then this is just to give you some uh, visual, uh, this what our Catmosphere founder is uh, from Saudi Arabia, she's actually uh, Princess Rima Bandar Saud, who is actually the Saudi ambassador to the US. So as a result of that, we did have a very large activation on the ground in Saudi itself. Uh, they activated all of their different provinces. And again, this is just very, very interesting snapshot, uh, organizing a lot of different walks with uh, again, people of all different ages, sizes, uh, genders, and a lot of interesting other activities that sprung out of this, several of which were climate focused. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, cleanups, we saw tree plantings uh, that also just happened as part of the, of the same acti activities. And then this is really some of the pictures on a global scale. And you know, we, we do have, we put, uh, don't have it here, but lots of great uh, participation from the Tafisa team. But you can see here just walks that took place everywhere from, you know, we have China, we've got Spain, we've got Brazil, Australia, the US. So really uh, very global. It was very exciting to see uh, really the excitement, both the physical walks and then how that manifested itself online through our social media activations. Um, as I mentioned, our partners, this was really important. I think it's, um, I'm a big believer in one plus one equals three. So really that was something that we were very uh, cognizant of and we really couldn't have done it without the incredible partners that we had. Um, so that again is a very, very high level overview of Catwalk. Uh, again, this is something we, we hope to continue in the years to come and really looking at telling the story of the big cats, but also at the same time incorporating other stories, including the need for physical activity, 
And then obviously the environment, environmental impact of both. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Beth. Very, very interesting example on how to connect the, the conservation of biodiversity, but also physical activity. So uh, very interesting example. We look forward to, to seeing the future of it in, in the next years and to continuing working with you. Thanks for the invitation, of course, to, to after Pisa join. Um, any questions to Beth, please write them in the chat once again, and we will come back to them after all the panel speakers have intervened. Rodolphe? Time for our next question. Indeed, and this time I'm already ready. Um, so the next one will be a more generic one, not related to sports. Uh, in your opinion, which part of all global human death are attributable to environmental factors? Once again, I'm starting now, and you will see the different questions and the different answers appear right now in front of you. After there is only one left, no worries. It will be the, the, the it will be one of the last. Yep, only five seconds left. And once again, it was it was really close, but most of you got the right answer. Yeah, it's twenty four percent. So once again, take some time to reflect on this uh, on this number, which is once again really high. Um, and what, what we wanted to, 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 to introduce with, this, with these questions is the fact that one key of mitigating uh, the consequences of climate change uh, for the health and life of citizens worldwide uh, could be to create uh, a better balance uh, between communities and uh, the habitats and environments around them. And uh, that's why our next speaker will help us understand why. Thank you and Jean-François, you have the floor again. Thanks, Rodolphe, once again for a very interesting fact. And indeed, our next speaker will introduce a very grassroots and community program taking place in, in Durban, in South Africa. We have with us Mrs. Alexandra Williams, who is Programs Development Consultant, but also Occupational Therapist at Durban Green Corridor, which is an NGO. And Alexandra will now introduce to us the Wilderness Parks Program. Alex, Alex the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um... I look forward to sharing a little bit more about my project. I'm just getting the presentation on the screen. Um, can everyone see that? It's charging. I'm sure it's coming in a second. Yeah, here we are. Great. Mm. Sorry, I just need to start the slideshow if you can. Give me two seconds. Okay, so today I'll be sharing a little bit about a project. Um, it's an interesting one. I work in the area of Inanda, close to Durban. Um, as you said, I'm, a, I'm an occupational therapist, so I think I will offer a little bit of a different perspective. Um, but the project itself is based on a partnership that was formed between the city of Bremen and the city of Durban. They have um, a climate partnership and um, this project itself, the Wilderness Park project draws on this design of green open spaces. Um, so finding an open space in a community and transforming it into something that can be used to, to better the community, which we'll get into a little bit more. Um, but yes, this is kind of a central task of this climate partnership that was formed between Bremen and Durban. Um, and the concept of the wilderness park is based on, I'm going to mispronounce this word, but the Kidna Wilderness in Germany, which is a natural playground, um, initially developed for children where they can go to this open space and really experience the benefits of nature, engage in physical activity. It's a safe space um, with an environmental emphasis as well. Um, so the Nanda Wilderness Park, um, we established it in 2018 and it kind of has two aspects to it. So there's this aim to address community issues, um, provide opportunities for meaningful, accessible, low cost occupations um, 
and ensuring this health and development across the lifespan, which as occupational therapists is very important to us. Um, and the other aspect is this identification, preservation of natural green spaces within communities. Um, so by doing that, we provide an important environment where community members can engage in these occupations, you know, have a safe space to engage in physical activity and activities that will benefit them. Um, so previously, this space you can see in the picture on the slide that we identified for the park was home to criminal activities, um, a lot of dumping, there was litter dumping, cattle grazing, um, cultural activities. It really just wasn't being used by the community. It was, it was a place for crime and yeah, not constructively used. Um, a little bit about the South African context, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, but outdoor and natural spaces are not commonly used for recreation or educational use, particularly in low income areas. Um, these spaces have a high prevalence of crime, violence. Um, Inanda, which is the community I'm presenting on now, has one of the highest gender-based violence um, statistics in the world, I believe, and as well as violence statistics. Um, so it really is quite an unsafe area. And um, children often don't have access to outdoor spaces. Um, this is worsened by the, the education system, which is overcrowded. Um, hindering development in childhood is very limited access to um, play areas and safe areas for development. Um, so yeah, I've covered all of this. I'm for time's sake, not going to go into too much detail, but all of this kind of results in a limited engagement in meaningful constructive occupations um, across the lifespan, not just within childhood, um, obviously affecting the physical and psychosocial well-being. Um, of the community members resulting in unconstructive use of time. Um, and then further to that, as an occupational therapist, our area of interest is people living with disabilities. They are even more so significantly marginalized and face even larger barriers to these meaningful occupations to accessing areas within the community. So that's, that's a big focus of ours as well. Um, and then occupational therapy, how we became involved. Um, many people don't know what we do, but to put it simply, we utilize human occupation as an intervention to promote health and well-being across the lifespan. Um, we have a very important role in early childhood development, but also engagement in occupations across the lifespan. So that's kind of how we fit into this wilderness park environment. Um, again, it was, was double-sided. There is this conservation aspect, but also ensuring that the space benefits the community. Um, so these safe spaces for sport, recreation, occupational engagement are essential for development and overall health and well-being across the lifespan. Um, so that's a little bit of background of, of how the, the park itself was developed and kind of the meaning behind it. Um, and like I said, initially it was, it was focused on childhood development, early childhood development, but we've since expanded. Um, we have quite a, a variety of programs, not all focusing on physical activity, but all focusing on well-being across the lifespan. So I'll go briefly through each of the programs. Um, the first one, which was the initial one, is an early childhood development program. Um, within this space, we've developed play equipment, um, sensory gardens, um, and then we have structured programs that are run by a community member within the space. Um, with the local schools, which are in walking distance. So we have an eight week program addressing all areas of development. So it's physical, your fine motor, cognitive, all areas of development in childhood. And we really have a focus on the use of nature and nature play in stimulating development. Partly because we are promoting this appreciation for nature, this understanding of nature, but also we are working in a very resource constrained environment. Um, so we really do have a focus on nature, nature play. Um, yes, that, that part of, of the project. Um, these are just some pictures of our programs. You can see we, we really try and incorporate um, environmental education into our programs as well as the physical activity. So it really is a holistic program. Um, we provide support to a lot of the schools and creches in the areas. Um, they are very understaffed, under-resourced. So as OTs, we, we go in and provide a lot of training. Um, we bring the classes to the park 
um, to expose them to that environment, a larger space, so they're not cramped up in the classroom. Um, and then another leg of our program, um, also a very successful one, we have a huge focus on, on active aging. Um, and in this community, often the elderly are marginalized and don't have access to, to meaningful activities. So we developed a program in partnership with an old age home in the area to promote this active aging. And we've developed a, a Zumba program, which is an exercise class, and then also a gardening program um, where these people can have a sense of autonomy and something to take control of. Um, so these are some pictures of, of our community members engaging in the programs. Um, and as you can see, the space is left quite natural. It's, it's a green open space where they can come and, and engage in their activities. Um, we also have, just to show you a little bit of variety, we have an arts program that we're starting up recently, um, also based on a project that's from, from Bremen. Um, and this was initially aimed to break down stigma relating to mental health conditions. Um, we engaged with moms of children with special needs to, to get them involved in this program. Again, so they can come to the space, this nat natural open space, engage in an activity, form these social, social bonds with individuals facing similar challenges um, and engage in a constructive activity. Um, yeah, so this is an ongoing project. We're still working on, on getting it off the ground, but it's just to give you a bit of an idea of, of the variety. Um, again, as OTs, we work very closely with people with disabilities. So um, we have a very good working relationship with the clinic nearby. Um, they refer any clients requiring our services. Um, and then they come to the park. So we really, again, focus on getting them out of this clinic environment into the natural environment and using that as much as possible to promote health, well-being, recovery. Um, and then this is a little bit more of our gardening program. It's not just for the elderly. Um, we have quite a lot of stakeholders involved. Um, again, the physical benefits of gardening are, are incredible as well as the, the psychosocial benefits. So this is a program we, we use a lot with a lot of our clients. Um, and then we also work very closely with the high school. Adolescence is a very vulnerable stage. It's a stage where you want to, to get um, individuals involved in constructive activities because often that's where drug use starts, um, yeah, crime starts. So that's a, a vulnerable population that we are focusing on now. Um, and then we have a partnership with the University of KwaZulu Natal, and they send um, their students to our site to provide extra hands, um, but also for them to gain experience in the community context. And um, they kind of help to uplift the project. They've built a lot of um, infrastructure that we use in our project. Um, and that's an overall view of the project. I hope I'm within my time limit. Um, and I haven't gone over. Um, yes, thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Alex, uh, for this once again very inspirational practice. I remember at the very beginning of our session in the word cloud that Rodolf uh, and all of you created the, the, work, the word respect and respectful was very much at the center uh, of, of how to fight against climate change. And I think it's, it's a very good example that you have introduced how to create this climate of respect between local communities, between the environment they live in, and how to unite those communities to, to, to protect it. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, I'd like to highlight as well that we will be reporting more about what the Urban Grid Corridor is doing in the coming months because you are part of the Active City Innovation Project, uh, where Tafisa is a partner of, uh, which is led by the Innovations Manufacture, but also the Technical University of Munich with the funding of the German government, uh, you are one of the experimental scenarios, so we will be following up very closely what you're doing and sharing more in the coming month. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex, for joining us. Any questions for you can be written in, uh, in the chat. And before we move to our last speaker, Rodolf, uh, we have a last question for today. Indeed, uh, our last questions, and it's actually one of my favorite ones. 
um, well, the ocean one was my favorite one, but uh, uh, this one is, is actually related to uh, the Olympic Games that were organized uh, in Tokyo. Uh, that were organized in Tokyo, and sorry, an issue. Sorry, my bad. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the Olympic Committee in Tokyo um, actually tried to get uh, the population involved and uh, the involvement was also in uh, the, the question of Olympic medals. So what was recycled to make the Tokyo Olympic medals, in your opinion? Still 30 seconds to answer. The last 30 seconds you will hear from me. It was indeed recycled electronics. I think you read you read the news well, uh, but it was actually it was actually I think a really really interesting uh, initiative to actually, of course, uh, get into the question of reuse recycling uh, within the context of the Olympic Games, but also a way to involve the host community when it comes to the big events and the mega sport events. Um, so this question was made to introduce also uh, all our speakers, of course. Because organization of the of the Olympic Games in Japan uh, found this innovative way to involve, as I, as I said, the host community. And if Olympic Games are a tool to broadcast uh, such messages, maybe our next speakers uh, will surely help us understand the role of Olympic sports uh, in that regard and in, in in mitigating climate change. So thank you. That was all for me, and thank you for participating to all those small questions. Thanks a lot, Rodolphe, and once again, thank you very much for preparing all of those questions for, for today. It was uh, very interactive. I really enjoyed it. I hope you all did as well. Uh, indeed, now turning to our last, uh, last speaker. We had before uh, quite a selection of speakers which were not directly from the Olympic movement, even though involved with sport, sport for physical activity. And now we will hear from an Olympic committee, uh, the German Olympic and Sports Confederation, and how they are they have developed a nationwide approach to, to protecting the climate and, and, the, and the environment. So I'd like to pass the floor to Bianca Cardocus, who is Officer for Sport Facilities, Environment and Sustainability at, Ger at the German Olympic Sports Confederation. Bianca, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here with you today. It's really a pleasure and I've learned a lot today. So thank you for that. Uh, and it would be nice if you could share my uh, presentation. Thank you. Ah, oh, yeah, there it is. Um, yes, I'm working for the German Olympic Sports Confederation for 12 years now, and there I'm responsible for topics like climate protection, sustainability, and sustainable sports events. And now I would like to shortly present you the approaches and challenges uh, relating to climate protection and sport uh, we are discussing at the DUSB uh, in Germany. So next slide, please. Thank you. Some words about the German Olympic Sports Confederation. Um, we are the umbrella organization for organized sports uh, in Germany. So we have 100 member organization. Um, these are the um, big sports associations in Germany. And they are standing for around uh, 80,070 sports clubs we have in Germany. Uh, in in these sports clubs, we have um, 27 million memberships. So we are not only uh, the Olympic Committee for Germany, but we are also the umbrella organization for sports for all in Germany. And our office is in Frankfurt. We have about 200 employees um, at the office. And so our topics are um, the competitive sports, like the Olympic team at the one side, but also all topics relating to uh, sports for all, like youth sports, topic like health, education, the different target groups we have in sports, and also the topics about environment and sports facilities. And um, yes, we are um, responsible for the administration of interests of our member organizations, but also for giving impulses and services for our members. Um, so next slide, please. 
And uh, what are the main topics we are discussing relating to climate protection and sport at the moment in Germany to, uh, to support uh, climate protection? Um, there are four main topics. Uh, one is uh, sports facilities, because in Germany we have more than 230,000 uh, sports facilities, but most of them are from the 1960s to 1980s, so, so they are really old and they have uh, high carbon emissions. So there is a high potential for energy efficient renovation of the sports facilities because they have a big impact on the uh, climate um, topic. On the other hand, we have the topic of sports events because also in Germany, we have uh, thousands of sports events each year. And so uh, the climate protection potentials um, are, for example, energy saving, and um, the biggest point is climate friendly mobility concepts, because uh, this is the main point of the carbon emission of the events we mostly have. And this is also the third uh, point uh, we are discussing. This is the topic of mobility, because we have a lot of uh, uh, traffic around sports. It's traveling to the sports club or to competitions, but it's also bringing um, spectators to the to the events or the, um, to the committee meetings, the different officials. And so we need environmental friendly approaches and means of transport to lower our uh, carbon emissions, um, which we have in the context of sport. And on the other side, um, the fourth uh, topic is rising awareness. Um, because we have this big number of sports clubs in Germany, around uh, 80, 70,000 sports clubs with all these members. And so, um, and they offer a great multiplier potential for raising awareness of climate protection in society at all. So these four topics are the main topics we are discussing uh, at the German Olympic Sports Confederation together with our member organizations. And we are trying to develop together concepts and, um, and measures to, um, to, to come forward with these uh, four topics. Next uh, slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and one example for approach uh, we are doing at the German Olympic Sports Confederation, we have adapted a sustainability strategy for our office in 2019. You can see it on the uh, graph on the right side. So um, there we have different spheres of responsibility within this uh, strategy. And we defined um, five goals, five sustainability goals. And I only want to mention one of uh, it. It's, uh, of course, climate protection, the topic we have today. And uh, there we have different fields of action, how we would like to reach our goals relating to climate protection. And this is one of our uh, big strategy we are working on at the DUSB at the moment. And one of the most important measures is to um, recording the climate footprint of our office and the carbon emissions we have. And uh, we are working on a um, reduction plan to lower our carbon emissions uh, during the next years. This is one of our measures we are at the moment are working on, um, on this reduction plan to be also a good example also for our member organizations uh, we have in Germany. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, and two other approaches or examples for projects. Um, one is a website, it's called Climate Protection and Sport. Um, and this website provides an initial overview of the topic of climate protection in sports. And there are different uh, tips for ex action for sports organization, for our member organizations, but also for sports clubs and for everyone who is um, uh, who's in sport and who wants to do something for the climate protection. Uh, this website is unfortunately not available in English, but the next one, this is a second website we are providing. It's called a Green Champion for Sustainable Sports Events. Uh, we developed it together with partners. And the aim is uh, to, to provide organizers with information around concrete uh, courses of action for planning and hosting sustainable sports events. And there you can find uh, different uh, topics relating to, to events and what you are concrete um, can do to, um, to get more sustainable while you are organizing and um, planning a, a sport event. This is also available in English. Okay, next slide, please. 
And this are the following uh, projects are some approaches of our member organizations. As I mentioned, we have 100 member organizations and we are working together with them on the topic of climate protection. And they all um, have a different kind of examples how they are working on this topic. For example, the German Ski Association, uh, they have a project related to um, education for sustainable development. It's called Ticket for Nature. And they offer special winter and summer camps uh, where pupils can take part in. And they gain um, sports and nature experiences and learn about aspects of sustainable development while doing um, sports in nature. Um, on the other hand, another example for uh, climate protection projects is on our regional level we have in Germany. There we have the regional sports confederations. In this case, for example, Hessen is one of our um, federal um, states in Germany. And they have for their sports clubs uh, so-called eco-checks. So the sports clubs um, get uh, visited from consultants from the sport confederation. And they visit the sports clubs and provide energy-related advices on the sports facilities. So the sports club get some advices how to uh, get more um, climate-friendly at their sports facilities. And the next slide, please. Two other um, projects from other member organizations. One is from the German Football Association. Because in 2024, we will have the European Football Championships in Germany. And uh, for this reason, um, they developed a comprehensive sustainability concept for this uh, championships. And climate protection is an important element of this uh, strategy. And I'm sure we will get uh, new ideas for sports and climate uh, protection in Germany uh, based on this sustainability concept. But because it's also focusing on the sports for all um, football clubs uh, in Germany. And the last uh, example uh, of a project of one of our member organizations is the German Alpine Association. They um, adopted a climate concept and a strategy with extensive measures for their um, member organizations or the Alpine uh, clubs we have in Germany. And the goal is um, climate neutrality by 2030. And for this reason, they also doing emission accounting for all their sections they have in Germany. And they have a um, carbon price, an internal carbon price, as an important control approach to lower um, their carbon emissions in Germany in their sport. So these were four projects from our member organization. They all have their own way to give good example for climate protection. And uh, yes, the approaches we are discussing at the moment. And there we will have my last uh, slide, please. Uh, yes, what are the challenges in Germany we are discussing? Of course, climate protection is an increasingly important issue for sports clubs and sports organization in Germany. There are many fields of action and opportunities to, to support climate protection and many clubs and associations are already active, but of course not all of them. And uh, so we need to reach out even more and make sports clubs fit for climate protection to come to action. And this also requires support for sport organizations because the main uh, focus they are having is sport, of course, that's their main point. But most of them really want to, um, to support the climate protection, but they need uh, some support. For example, through professional advices, but also consideration of sport in climate processes from the municipal to the state level, because there are a lot of different processes at the moment on different levels in Germany relating to climate protection. And we need to be partners in these processes to, to support also the general uh, processes we have in Germany on uh, climate protection. And of course, we also need financial support, especially for the sports facilities, because as I mentioned, they are really old in Germany and they have high carbon emissions and we need a lot of money to, um, to renovate them energy efficient and that needs a lot of money. And let, last but not least, sport organizations, of course, are good partners for climate protection because with their wide structures they have 
around the whole country, they are a great multiplier to raise awareness for this important topic. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Bianca. Once again, very interesting approach that you have presented to us. We are getting close to the end of our session, but I believe we have time for, for, for one question per, per speaker. I see that, that some questions have been asked already in, in the chat. Maybe we will stay with you, Bianca, uh, already. We have a question from Jost Beers, who is asking whether the German sports sector has nationwide sustainability targets as well. Uh, you have shown examples of some federations with uh, their own goals, but is there a, a German sports sector nationwide sustainability target? Not at the moment. The um, strategy, the sustainability strategy we have is focusing on the DUSB and, and our uh, headquarter. And we are also cooperating with our member organizations and they also have their goals. But at the moment, we don't have a, a, a nationwide approach. But I think that will be the next step after we have doing our homework at the DUSB. The next step could be to see how we can do it all together and bring all the different goals together. Thanks, Bianca. I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, if I look at the next question, I will turn to, to Antidia from the Surf Rider Foundation. There is a question from Leonardo asking, in your point of view, what are the biggest challenges when trying to, to make people or institutions aware of the climate goals as part of the goals of, of Surf Rider? Well, the, the, the main challenge is uh, to realize that is, this, there is an emergency. I think that uh, we don't have any more climate skepticals. We all do know that there is uh, a problem with climate. We all see uh, the the many consequences. I think that the Kentucky uh, last uh, uh, act, well incidents uh, and tornado uh, let us know that we are all. Uh, in danger with that climate change, but the main difficulty is how, how we do this, how, what are the next step, what is a little next step, and I think that the, the big issue is to build in common some roadmaps to feel and to to invest in those roadmap as a priority. I think that are the this is the main issue. Uh, we are conscious now, but we need to act and how to act is a, is a big gamble to deliver. Thank you for this, NTD, I much appreciate it. Um, now, turning to, to Bev, I saw during your presentation quite a number of participants who, who were very enthusiastic and wrote down that they took part in, in, in the catwalk this year. And if I were them, I'd be very curious, what's in the pipeline? What comes next uh, in connecting physical activity with, with the safeguarding of big cats? Thanks so much, Jean-François. It's a really good question. And we are actually still working on the answer to that. I don't have that as of right now. Uh, we're busy working on our strategy for next year. But our goal is certainly to continue to build on what we built this year, get more people involved. Hopefully COVID will truly be behind us behind us by November next year, so that will give us more opportunity to do in-person events as well. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, I also I see now that Just Bears uh, also uh, share, sharing and continuing the exchange with Bianca wrote uh, in the chat, the Dutch roadmap for creating a sustainable sports sector. So it could be a tool which is very interesting for anybody interested in the room in any country to, to, to use. Uh, now turning to you, Alex, uh, Dr. Christopher Mal from, from the Technical University in Munich is asking how, how you would describe or rate physical activity as a mediator, as a tool to create environmental literacy within children or to enhance their environmental literacy. I hope I can answer this one clearly. I can maybe describe how we we use it. Um, so in our early childhood development programs, um, as OTs, we have a lot of goals in terms of um, physical development, so gross motor development of the children. And um, we really try and tie this in with um, the environmental education. And an, an example of how we do this um, we obviously pitch it specifically towards their age group, depending on their, their, 
where they are in their development. Um, but we may use, um, we do use a lot of storytelling um, pitched at the appropriate age. And then um, the physical aspect will come in um, where we ask the child to maybe act out a scenario, um, complete an obstacle course. Um, I don't know if you saw in the presentation, there was a picture of um, all the kids with binoculars and then a little bird. There was a big bird painting. Um, that is one of our sessions that focuses a lot on environmental education where um, the children will go on a little hunt and try and find um, grass to make a bird's nest. And then that kind of links back to a session where they're learning about birds, they're learning about the environment around them. Um, there's a little story. They learn about the sounds that birds make, what birds eat, why do we need to protect the birds around us? Um, that's just one example. Um, but in all of these sessions, we kind of targeting um, physical development, environmental education, um, getting them out in nature. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> it's just an example of how we might tie in our, our physical aims with the environmental aspect. Yes, thanks you very much uh, for, for this, Alex. Um, to close our, our roundtable and our panel discussion, I would have one last question, and maybe every every speaker, every panelist could could to, could share his or, or her thoughts because we have a hundred percent female panel today. Could share her thoughts about this this question, uh, which was asked by by Zane de Silva from the Sports for Social Change Network in South Africa. How do we address the need to protect climate and the environment if normal basic human needs or rights? cannot be addressed in some parts of society or in some parts of the world. So I'd be very curious to, to close the panel to hear your thoughts on that. Maybe we can start in the order of, of, of speakers. I don't know whether Antidia you'd like to start off. And follow Sorry, so, so, the sound have been cut uh, for me. Could you repeat the... Uh... The question is just a, yes the last question yeah the question is how do we address the need to protect climate and the environment if normal basic human needs and rights cannot be addressed in some parts of the world i think that we cannot address i think that it's uh, uh, obvious if we are not including everyone in this challenge if we are not sharing our knowledge with all the community if we are not facilitating a common dialogue. I think that we cannot manage uh, this challenge. This is about all of us. This is about solidarity. And solidarity is not something that we could negotiate. We have to build it in common. Thanks, Antidia, for, for those closing words from your side. Now turning to, to Ben. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, really, I completely would agree with what Antidia said. And just to build on that, I think you know, there's obviously a lot of very big challenges out there in the world and none, none of which are particularly easy to solve, but I think every step forward is a step in the right direction. Uh, for us at Catmosphere, it's really our, you know, as I mentioned before, our primary focus is the cat conservation, but it's also about community and education throughout. And I think where, wherever possible, we try to weave in as many other messages as possible. So that, that would certainly be one we, we try to address where, where we can. Thanks, Beth. I'll now turn again to, to Alex for, for your thoughts on this. Thank you. Um, I obviously am working in um, a very low socioeconomic environment. Um, so these are challenges that we face. And I agree um, with what the other two speakers have said. Um, part of what, what we might do, um, obviously my project is a little bit different, but for example, someone facing food scarcity or, or um, you know, not having access to even enough food, um, that would be an opportunity for us to involve them um, in our horticultural program and um, kind of get them out into the natural environment. It's not necessarily, necessarily addressing any huge issues, but even just getting them out into the natural environment, um, experiencing nature, while addressing their needs, um, may get them to start thinking of the environment around them. Um, 
and then maybe in the future they can can get to a place where we can start to address that but but even just getting them out into nature into a place where they they are appreciating the environment around them um is a starting point i i feel personally yes indeed uh, thanks a lot uh, for that uh, alex and finally bianca i only can agree i think most of it is about raising awareness and education but also that the countries who have good access to all they need that we have to be a good example also for, for climate protection yes thanks Thank you, Bianca. So to be a good example, to be role models, uh, I think this this is a very a, a very good point as well. And those were really the closing words of of our workshop today. I would like to once again thank all of our speakers today. Maybe we can give them a round of applause. I would like to thank as well uh, our partner for this uh, for this workshop, the think tank Sport and Citizenship, and in particular uh, my my buddy uh, today, Rodolf, for all of those inspiring questions. I think it has been a fantastic fifth workshop uh, of the series of our talks, TAFISA Mission 2030 workshops. Uh, we will continue, of course, next year in 2022. And the next workshop will be on the general theme of education in February. So you will be all invited to participate. Before that, and uh, I would like to ask my colleague Gaëtan to, to share the screen uh, quickly, you are all invited to join us on the 26th of January to the Interact Opening Conference. Uh, the Interact Project uh, stands for International and European Sport Organizations Activate Citizens, reflects on how international sport federations and organizations can promote and develop sport for all participation. We are opening registrations uh, and you are all welcome to attend. Uh, you will receive in the next hours a short questionnaire and would really appreciate you taking less than one minute to answer it, to provide your feedback, to help us improve our workshops in future. And of course, the recording will be available on the Tafisa YouTube channel, uh, as well as the various presentations. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you all at our next events. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>